What's up, wild side besties and baddies? I'm Bailey. And I'm Chelsea. And we're here to walk you through the wild sides. From homicides to hosticides and everything in between. We're so glad you're here, so buckle up and enjoy the ride. I'm really happy that I didn't die. I know. I know. I know. I'm back, you guys. I'm out of the hospital. I had a, I think it's rational, but a really irrational fear that I was going to die on the operating table. Sure. And like, I just had to get my gallbladder removed and everybody was like, literally, it's the most common surgery ever in the history of surgeries. Yeah. But I sat in a hospital for a week because I had a really bad like infection and it was just a whole mess. And um, I just sat in my own thoughts in my own hotel, hotel room, hospital room for like nine days. And I just, you know, and I used all my therapist tools to not spiral, but I was just like, oh, well, you know, if I'm going to be here next week. And so our kind of inside joke, Zach is always, he's told me like, hey, I'm really glad you didn't die. And I'm like, me too. So here we are. Well, I mean, it's your first rodeo, right? I mean, you just all of a sudden get into the throes of this stuff and you're just like, oh, crap. You know, I always think of um, the delivery, the labor and delivery process where you, you get kind of elbows deep in this thing. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, my gosh, I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to do this. Like this baby's never going to be delivered. Yeah, I'm die of just sheer exhaustion and pain you know like you you get to these breaking moments where you're just like i can't do it but then you get on the other side and you're like oh i mean and you're grateful and i'm super grateful to be here and celebrate my daughter's third birthday so i got to see that so i'm happy yeah it's all good it's all good well i mean i feel like I'm going to give you a case that, again, it has a lot of bad moments where you're just like, I don't, I don't think I can do this. But I think at the end, we're going to be grateful and happy that we did this case. And this is interview week, right, Charles? This is this is interview week. So I don't really know how it wound up that I am presenting the case for your Dr. Loftus, because she is kind of your, your idol. You know, what is that? What do we call them? Like professional crushes. Yeah, or professional what? crush. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it landed like that. And, you know, I started trying to research a case that pertained to false memory, which is what Dr. Loftus specializes in. And she was quoted in an article about this case essentially saying this is one of the most involved in depth one of the worst cases she has seen of false memory and so i was like well then i'll do this case right like easy peasy no can it'll be interesting because i think a lot of therapists might not really like dr loftus's work because she's essentially saying like we don't have these repressed memories like repressed memories don't exist you don't just wake up and all of a sudden remember something that that happened to you. Mm-hmm. Like that's essentially like what a mix of different memories, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. And I mean, she goes on to essentially coin them as false memories. Mm-hmm. You know, yes, they are memories, but they're not truly memories because they're fabricated. It it's quite it's quite a complex study and beyond interesting and like i said this case i was ticking all the boxes and i said yeah this is great we'll do this and then of course like three weeks later and a seven part six part hbo documentary series later and huge reporting later i didn't realize how big this case was all that to say I did not realize that HBO had just released a yeah. huge docu series on this. Well, I have that... to watch it after we record this because oh, it'll be interesting. I, if you are into true crime, what do they say? Run, don't walk to this docu series. Uh, so it's called Mind Over Murder, and HBO released it in 2023. And I would highly recommend 
you watched this. They did a phenomenal job. And furthermore, you know, Bailey is always laughing because she tends to find cases that she knows will trigger me and like burn my biscuits. And that was not my intention on, on this case. But the more I got into it, I was like, this is the ultimate burn Bailey's biscuits. Oh, case. man. Like, Bailey, I have a feeling that you are going to do what I do in so many cases and just shake your head. Like, you, like there are no words. There are no words on how mad. Well, I want to get into it. I'm excited. As a therapist, Bailey, do you ever listen to a person recount something that had happened and it is so unbelievable that you just have to sit there for a second and say like I, I need to process some of this information before I can really give you a response like an appropriate response yeah that's happened a couple of times right where people will tell me something and I'm just like there's no way yeah I mean, it's just a lot that's you a know, lot like, yeah it's a lot so I think that's what we have in its truest form here with the murder of Helen Wilson. And this case, this murder of Helen Wilson would go on to be coined as the Beatrice Six. The Beatrice? Yeah. It's not Beatrice. It is called Beatrice. Why is it Beatrice and not Beatrice? Because this case happened on a Tuesday, February 5th, 1985, in Beatrice, Nebraska. Okay. All right. Well, kind of like us being raised in the kill. And it, yep. it's absolutely not the kill. It's literally Kiln, Mississippi, but everybody calls it the calls kill. It the I kill. imagine I imagine that Beatrice, for whatever reason, you know, they it just call reminds it reminds me of that um Key and Peel skit oh the yeah d nice yeah yeah exactly beatrice so like i said on tuesday february 5th 1985 helen wilson was battling a chest cold when her son daryl wilson paid his usual visit she lived in an apartment there in beatrice by herself she was an elderly woman and that was part of her routine is her son, Daryl, would come over and also Daryl's wife, Katie, would just come over in the evenings and hang out with her, mm -hmm. right? Katie was off bowling What when the visit first started and after her bowling game, she came over to her mother-in-law's house and they sat around and talked. So Helen was the type, she was our type of coffee drinker, Bailey. So mm -hmm. that coffee is going... 24 7 24 all seven. time yep like you drink it in the mornings you might drink it even in the afternoons you drink it for sure at night yeah, bailey and i sure. are at night coffee drinkers and go to sleep right after and go to sleep right after and helen was that type of lady you know she was our type of lady but because she was fighting this chest cold that ended up being pneumonia she Ooh. told daryl and katie you know i just don't really feel like it tonight right and you know that you're sick when you're like i really don't even want a cup of coffee i just want to go to bed yeah helen told katie that she was just gonna take her cough syrup and go to bed katie said that sounds good and then katie said do you want me to call you at midnight to wake you up so you can take another dose of your cough medicine and helen said sure and katie said okay i'll go home and I'll call you at midnight, and it'll wake you up, and you'll take your cough syrup. She said, great. That's Cap. And I don't know huh? why. I feel like this is Cap. I don't know why. I don't trust it. <laughs> so Katie went home. You know, Katie and Daryl, they both went home. And at midnight, Katie woke up, and she called her mother-in-law. And the phone rang and rang and rang and rang and rang. Nobody answered. So she hung it up. And she called it again. And this time it rang a couple of times and then got that weird 1980s dial tone that like. Cool. And Katie just assumed that, 
you know, she had fallen asleep or she kind of picked it up and hung it up kind of like, oh, I know I need to get up, take my cough syrup and go back to bed. Right. She wasn't feeling well and she just wrote it off. Yes, well, so now we're at Wednesday, February 6th, the next morning. Now, Helen's sister lived next door to her. Helen's sister and Helen's um, brother-in-law lived next door on that first story apartment complex there in Beatrice, Nebraska. Helen's sister got up, went over to her house, opened the door, it was unlocked, and goes in to check on Helen because, again, Helen had been sick. Was that a normal thing for her to just go over yeah. and check on her? It was not normal for the door to be unlocked. Oh. The door was unlocked, and again, oh, she probably just fell asleep. She hadn't been feeling well, got out of her routine, yada, yada, yada. So she goes in. It's this little tiny apartment, right? You go in. You have the little tiny little dining room area to your right. You have the living room kind of to your left. You make a dog leg to the right down past the little kitchen, and you're in the little bedroom. Well, she gets into the bedroom, and the bedroom is a wreck. And Helen's not in there. Ooh. So she just turns around, panics, runs out of the apartment, goes next door and gets her husband, right? Helen's brother-in-law. And they come over and take a look around, which, again, I'm like, it's such a small apartment. But they are elderly and you're panicked, all these things. Well, they find Helen laying face up on her living room floor bound and smothered and dead no so they walked through this tiny ass apartment yeah and did not see their sister slash sister-in-law bound up and tied in the middle of the living room floor until they she went back to get her husband and search again yeah that's cap yeah they would place the call to 911 at 929 in the morning on Wednesday, February the 6th. Let's talk really quick about Helen Wilson. And let me just tell you, she is everything that you want in a mom and a grandma. So Helen Wilson was born July 13th, 1916, and she was the fourth of five children. She was born to this little, of course, farming couple out there in the middle of Nebraska, and she grew up singing and playing the ukulele in a band with her siblings. And it earned her the nickname Little Miss Sunshine. How cute. And that was according to her daughter, Jan Hausman. So in 1934, Helen married Ray Wilson. They had three children, Dan, excuse me, Jan, Daryl, and Larry. But then in 1966... Ray died of a heart attack at 54 mm -hmm. and it really it really did a number on Helen like she really went through a, an extremely hard time and and kind of just had a breakdown um she had taken a little job at a nursing home after he had died but shortly after she eventually just had to stop working and just go home and she really needed a lot of support from family members and counselors. But eventually, you know, years passed and she started getting better. And she finally was out of that dark phase and got back to her normal self, started cleaning houses, ironing clothes, babysitting at the church. Like, to me, it kind of reminds me of my mammal. Like, it kind of reminds me of our mammal. Bailey was a little bit too young to remember a whole bunch about mammal. But when I think of Helen, I think of mammal. She would save up her money and she would uh, take bus trips. And it was usually just to visit her family. And she enjoyed playing bingo and spending time with her friends. And what is so sweet to me is anytime she would travel or any little adventure she would go on, she would record herself like with a cassette tape. How adorable is this? She's the cutest person ever. And she would write poems when she started had it, having grandchildren and great-grandchildren, she started writing poems for each of them. Aww. So one of the poems was to her um, great-granddaughter, Stephanie Hausman. And this is the poem. A blonde little head on a pillow so white. A peek out of one eye and my finger held tight. 
two angel feet outstretched from under cover, and I just think I'm that darling's great grandmother. Oh, how cute. <laughs> Can you, like, Bailey, can you even? No. Like, how precious is Helen? She reminds me of, it's giving me Melody Roar vibes. It Oh, it so is. It so is. Or even, like, honestly, I don't know, even Birdie. Like, I think that you're Yeah, Birdie. I was going to say my mother-in-law. I think that's why this case, I think it's, number one, so important to talk about who Helen was. Yeah. And by all accounts, I mean, she literally was the glue for this family. Everybody was like, I mean, it was, it was Mama Helen. It was Grandmama Helen. It was Great Grandmama mm -hmm. Helen. And she was the matriarch of this family. Mm -hmm. So finding her in the state that they found her was obviously devastating, but I feel like it was absolutely devastating to the family, to the community. Like, how in the world yeah. could some? it's precious? Something happened yeah. to somebody that's precious. I can see that. So now we're going to get into the hard parts. Are you ready? Okay. Helen Wilson was brutally raped and suffocated in her home. She was lying face up with her hands bound, her nightgown pushed up to her chest, and an afghan, which is one of those hand-knitted blankets, that's, that's what people in the Midwest call them, or afghans, and an afghan wrapped so tightly around her face that when it eventually was removed by the medical examiners, her nose was smushed, like wouldn't. It was so it was so distorted. There was so much pressure that the nose wouldn't go back to its previous position. Helen's arm was broken with two ribs also broken and her vagina was ripped. The police discovered blood on her mattress, the walls, her underwear, her nightgown, as well as semen in and on her body. Wow. So the investigators initially speculated that the perpetrator might have been someone driven by religious fervor, given the proximity of several churches, or possibly a homosexual, because of the fact that um, Helen had been raped vaginally as well as anally. The police photographed and videotaped the crime scene and then collected the samples of bodily fluid that were all over the apartment. So you have to think, it's 1985. DNA evidence is in its infancy and really not available to right. a small police force like you're dealing with in Nebraska. And the town of, De of Beatrice, Nebraska, is about 12,000. And honestly, there's not a ton more people there now. You know what I mean? Like, it's just this little dot on the map type of town. Mm. However, serology reports were available and had been used for quite a while at this point. So people could detect if it was, you know, type O, type A, type B blood, right? Even though we couldn't do a lot of DNA testing um, or real advanced DNA testing, we could tell what blood types were. Helen Wilson's blood type was type O. What they found around the apartment was a type B non-secretor. Okay. Now, of course, I had to figure out what non-secretor meant. And if you are a person that has a blood type that is a non-secretor blood type, that means that you do not secrete the antigens of your blood type into bodily fluids like saliva, tears, breast milk, urine, or semen. Okay. And that was very, very important, number one. But number two, that really narrows down the people. Because Is it type more rare to have a non-secretor? Well, type B, number one, is rare, and it's more rare to be a non-secretor. Oh, okay. Right? So you're, you're talking like maybe 10% of people would have this type of blood type mixed with the non-secretor right. aspect. So the next day, Thursday, February 7th, 1985, the Beatrice Daily Sun front page headline reads, Autopsy Reveals Victim Sexually Assaulted Death by Suffocation. The article would go on to include that the door was pried open, a footstool was overturned, Helen's hands were bound, the apartment was not ransacked, 
even though the the be- the bedroom was in disarray, but it was more like a struggle type of right. disarray. It was not that the apartment was just turned over. And they believed the motive was not robbery due to the fact that no personal possessions were missing. In fact, they found like $1,200 just sitting in the a top drawer right. in Helen's apartment. Mm-hmm. So this one article pretty much details the entire crime scene, which to me, if you are at all any sort of true crime person, that is strike number one. Like you do not put that sort of detail in a newspaper article because then you're going to get people who are like, oh, yeah, I was there and the door was pried open and a footstool was turned. Like they'll pretty much just tell you what they'll confess to stuff using only what was in or maybe you do put that in there and that's how you weed people out i don't know i guess it could go either way but obviously the the fact of the matter is is we've got to figure out who did this to helen let's go ahead and review and i'm going to do this a couple of times in this case let's review the facts helen wilson was murdered and raped the cause of death was suffocation two Two blood types were found at the scene, type O belonging to Helen and a type B non-secretor belonging to an unidentified male, right? Because of the presence of semen. Three, what we know is Helen's sister and brother-in-law found Helen, found her body and made the 911 call at 929 in the morning of Wednesday, February 6th, 1985. That's what we know. Right. Okay. Police Chief Don Luckroth had a theory that Helen's murderer murderer was connected to a string of assaults and attempted rape on three elderly females that occurred in Beatrice two years prior to that. So in 1983, in the summer of 1983, there were a string of attempted assaults and attempted rapes on elderly females. I wonder what Mark Safrick would have to say about this because his specialty was an elderly I know. Um, you know, assault and murder. That's such a good point. I had not thought about that. No. The Beatrice police force decided to utilize some of the newer approaches in the field of crime. Uh, one of those approaches was to utilize hypnosis, and they called upon a local psychologist and Deputy Sheriff Dr. Wayne Price. I don't like this. Did you hear what I just yeah. said? Yeah. A psychi- psychiatrist or psychologist. Psychologist. psychologist and a deputy sheriff. And a deputy sheriff. No, ma'am. No, sir. And he would perform the hypnosis on all on a possible witness, and he would perform a hypnosis on a possible witness of one of those attacks that happened two years ago, right? Like that's how they started is, oh, let's bring in this person who is a possible witness on this other crime. Let's see if he can jog their memory. And this is kind of where Dr. Loftus talks about this part of history that they deem the memory wars, right, Bailey? Yeah, and I think a lot of it had to do with, like, satanic panic and all the claims of being abused by some satanic ritual and stuff like that. And that was present in the 80s. Yeah. Um, And that's, again, where it was like psychiatrists and psychologists were starting to use things like hypnosis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hypnosis for recovered memories and stuff. And the scientific field were starting to say, like, no, we don't think that that's how this works. Right. Us who study, you know, the brain and the anatomy, right? Furthermore, the Beatrice police called on Peter Klismet Jr., who was an FBI profiler, for help. So they brought down Klismet into this case and this was a good job bringing in the fbi yep dude so the beatrice police really were doing a lot of things right in my opinion i don't like the whole dr price thing but good job on bringing in fbi i mean but also to be fair it's much it's easy it's 2024 1985 you know the venn diagram of a psychologist and a deputy sheriff 
I mean, there's definitely a place for that. I don't like the idea of that being like you're actively practicing in both of those. But I think that there's absolutely a place for like you were a sheriff's deputy and then you wanted to become a therapist to help or vice yeah. versa. Like, sure. Mm -hmm. um, so and it's all I'm really saying is, no. well, yeah, and it wasn't necessarily quote unquote unethical then because that, I mean, I don't like it now knowing what I know. But I also don't know what the laws were regarding that stuff back then. I know. When Klismet gets involved in the psychological profiling, he suggested to the force that the killer was likely a white male under the age of 30 who was either from or very familiar with the area of Beatrice. Hmm. He also believed that he was socially isolated. He was a socially isolated individual who had undergone psychological counseling, collected pornography, and exhibited odd and wimpy behavior, and likely had a hatred or dislike towards older females. Towards his mama. Yeah. Klismet concluded by saying, We can state with almost total certainty that this crime was committed by one individual acting alone. Mm hmm. Okay. Gary Weib and Bill Fitzgerald were assigned to the case. They were the two lieutenants that were assigned to the case. And after about a month of not really anything super solid, a suspect would land in the Beatrice Police Department's lap, or rather, he would just walk through the front door. Okay. So Mike Hyatt walked into the police station, stating that he had some information on the Helen Wilson murder. He claimed that he was hanging out with a childhood buddy of him who was back in town by the name of Bruce Allen Smith. Smith you know, had probably that dude because every time they assign a um, first, middle, and last name, that's usually the first and like think about it. Every time it's a bad guy, it's the first, middle, and last name. Yeah, that's a good point. Like it's not, you know, Lee Oswald, it's Lee Harvey Oswald. That's a good point. And it's not John Booth, it's John Wilkes Booth. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. So they're calling this dude by by triple the name, name, that's not good. By his Christian name. <laughs> Bruce Allen Smith had lived in Beatrice with his grandmother for some time during his childhood, but moved away to Oklahoma. He had moved away. He had come back for whatever reason, right? Like he was back in Beatrice and he was there on the night of February 5th, 1985. Hyatt stated that he had run into Smith at the RNS bar, right? That just one local bar there in town, and they drank until about midnight. Zero. Smith, who was 22 at the time, he was expressing some frustration, and he said that if, excuse me, and he said he hadn't, quote, had any for quite some time and was determined to get some Correct. one way or another. So the two decided to go to this party down in a local trailer park about 20 miles south of Beatrice. At the party, Smith persistently harassed one of the girls there demanding some action. And eventually he passed out. And this all led to the people at the party that were hosting this party to kick him out of the trailer. They were like, you're drunk, you're a jerk, go home. And so Mike Hyatt told him he'd drive him back home, and he stated that on the way back to Beatrice, Smith angrily vowed to get even with the people in the trailer, right? So he was going to get some, he was going to kick some, he was going to smoke some, he was gonna, just going to do a lot of sums, <laughs> right? Okay. I bet this friend is like, nice to see you, buddy. I'm so glad you're back in town. Back in town. It's been fun. Hyatt claims that he dropped his buddy off about 3.45 in the morning at 6th and Court Street, which was about two blocks south of Helen Wilson's apartment. 
and it was about six degrees below freezing that night. And Smith took off, started walking north, right? So he's drunk, he's angry, he's all spun up, it's cold, all the things. He's super horny. And he's super and horny. inappropriate. Yeah. Yep. He's a walking boundary violation. Right. Yeah. Pretty much. And so, of course, investigators, YB and Fitzgerald quickly pursue this lead. They're like, this is this is our dude. Absolutely. I love it. Open shut. It is a great day to be a lieutenant on the Beatrice police force. They were told by one of Smith's acquaintances that they they had seen Smith the day after the murder and he had scratches all over his face and his hands. And then they told him that Smith had said that he had gotten into a fight with Mike. And then he had told another person that he had got, you know, hit in the face with a pool stick. You know, he just had all these reasons as to why he was all scratched up. And what's the weird dude's name again? Bruce Allen. Bruce. So, and yeah, Mike Bruce. was his friend. He walked into the police station. Right. Okay. So the police then uh, spoke with one of the woman, one of the women at the trailer, because in their search in the proximity of Helen Wilson's apartment, they found her wallet, and it had her ID in it, but it was missing sixty bucks. And they, you know, she was like, "Yep, this is mine." The only thing I can think of is this Bruce dude probably took it. You know, when we kicked him out. You know, he was being a jerk. And, and whose wallet was this? One of the ladies that was at that house party, that trailer party. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right? Yeah. They also talked to a gas station attendant who said that that she could identify this dude, that he had come in, had stolen a bag of chips, and she noticed that he was all scratched up, right? So we have multiple people who are like, oh, yeah, we saw him the day after he was scratched up. They even got a surveillance camera showing that he got on a bus and was heading uh, southbound. And they were able to figure out that he was going back to Oklahoma City. Okay. Right. So they have all of this information. On March 5th, 1985, the investigators requested a court order to collect blood, hair, saliva, and fingerprints from Smith. And they headed south to Oklahoma to get this information. The Oklahoma authorities informed them that Smith was a suspect in a 1981 rape case. And in 1984, the Oklahoma police had investigated a homicide with similarities to the Helen Wilson case, believing that he was involved in that as well. So, I mean, Bailey, like, this is our dude, right? Everything... Everything is pointing to him. Mm -hmm. They drive down there. They find him on March 7th. They question him. They ask him to give over a sample of hair, blood, saliva, give over DNA. He says, sure, yep. He gives all of those over, complies, no issues, says he wasn't there. They take all of that information they run it through the processing, the forensic crime lab down there in Oklahoma City, and it comes back and he's not a match. I was going to say, we've heard a lot of those cases, or I've seen a lot, either documentaries or just true crime cases in general. Um, like the one, I don't know why, but it stands out to me, but you remember that Mia Zapata, she was the underground kind of grunge lead singer, I can't remember the band, but around the time you know with nirvana and whatnot and she was found like on the side of the road i think she had been like beaten and raped and and she was killed and it wasn't until like years and years and years later that they ran i guess dna that they found and it was just like this random dude from out of state who had just been passing through and there was like all of these you know, like better suspects that they thought would have been the people who would have done that to her. But it ended up just being like this random truck driver dude from like Florida passing through. Like how many cases are there like that? 
Yeah. Yeah. And that's essentially what was going on here. The reports came back. He was a type B blood, but he was a secretor. And, <laughs> and it was very, very, very clear that he was a secretor and the blood that was at the crime scene was a non-secretor. Can that ever change? Do you know? Like, can you ever be a secretor? No. No. Or, it's, okay. it's, it's just like blood type, you know. You either are or you are not. Yeah, you either are or you are not. There's okay. no no gray, no mutations. It just is what it is. And this was their only lead, and it ruled it out. And so now they're back to square one with absolutely nothing. Wow. That's why they say, like, don't get, what's like, the word? Like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't get your eyes set on, like, one individual. And I imagine it's so difficult because you're sitting there like, who else could it be? Like... Yeah, this dude, it's obviously this guy. And then you get this back, it's and it's not. Guy. And that's why you, sh you know, I hear people talk so much about like um, investigators not pigeonholing yourself into a suspect yeah. for that reason. Right, right. Well, they would go on to take hair and blood samples from Bailey, like forty different guys, forty, yeah. sixty different people. And and you have to remember, this is a really small town, right? right. Like you don't have a huge pool that you can pull from. So about this time, right, like right after he was crossed out, crossed off the list, Burdette Searcy, who had been keeping up with this case, learned that it had lost, lost steam, no arrest, and it was kind of starting to go cold. And Burdette Searcy, better known as Bert, what did he say? Not around here, partner. Oh, I love Not it. What did around. he do? Her. Cersei decided he would come out of retirement from law enforcement because oh. he had retired from law enforcement two years prior. He would leave his life as a pig farmer there in the Beatrice area, and he was going to solve this mother loving case. I love people like that who mm -hmm. just have that itch and they just mm -hmm. follow through with it. Yeah. And as we would say here in the South, come hail or high water, he was yeah. going to solve this case. So he took it upon himself. He went and contacted uh, Helen Wilson's family and asked them if he could investigate as a private investigator, go out on his own and, and solve this case. Yeah. And of course, they were like, absolutely. And you have to, again, think. You know, rewards are starting to add, right? People are like, we'll give you $1,000, and now it's up to 1500 and now it's up to 3000 And families are getting desperate, right. right? Which was normal, but I think especially when you really, when it was somebody like Helen. Right. I mean, your family is just like, we've got to figure this out. We this, this can't. This is not okay. So the first thing that he decided to do was start interviewing the people that he, from his previous line of work, like from his previous time there in law enforcement, he started just asking the people who usually know stuff about stuff, right? You go to the local bars, you you go and figure out kind of that, that underbelly area, right. and you start asking questions. Well, as he started getting more and more information, he started developing this idea that there had to have been more than one person involved in Helen's murder and he began to suspect a handful of people right he's starting to really build this case in his head but again he's a private investigator right so in 1987 Searcy applied for and was hired back on as deputy sheriff by Sheriff Jerry DeWitt for the Gage County Sheriff's Department Okay. So Jerry DeWitt, Sheriff Jerry DeWitt, along with the Gage County attorney, Richard Smith, they authorized Searcy with assistance from other deputies, including Gerald Lampkin and Wayne Price, right? Doctor, psychologist, oh, yeah. deputy, this Wayne guy. Price, to launch a formal investigation into Wilson's murder. So now you have the Beatrice police investigating 
and also the Gage County Sheriff's Department launching their own official investigation. Interesting. Very. Searcy's key witness while he was in that phase of private investigating was a woman named Lisa Pudendorf. She was a 17-year-old girl who went to high school with another girl named Joanne Taylor. Okay. Stephen Covey, he's an American author. He's the guy who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Have yeah. you heard of this? There's a quote that I love of his, and I think it's so accurate. He says, we are free to choose our actions, but we are not free to choose the consequences of those actions. Yeah. And this interview with Lisa Podendorf is where I believe this case turns into a twisted witch hunt, domino effect, Alice in Wonderland debacle. Okay. During Lisa Podendorf's, and I'm going to refer to her as Podendorf from now on, during her interview with Why Cersei. Why Podendorf and not Lisa? Just curious. I don't know. We can say Lisa, yeah. So according to Lisa, according to Lisa in her interview with Cersei, she stated that on February 6th, the day that Helen Wilson's body was discovered, she was standing outside of Helen's apartment around 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And she was trying to figure out why there were so many police cars at the building. She states that Joanne Taylor comes up to her and just stands next to her and they start talking. Did they know each other? Yeah, they, they know each other. They go to high school together okay. and they, you know, and they just start talking. Lisa says, huh. I wonder what's going on over there. I wonder why there are so many police cars, right? In true normal human being fashion. And that's where Lisa then tells Circe that Joanne says, oh, you don't know? An old lady got killed over there last night. Lisa says, what? How do you know? And Joanne says, I know because Lobo and me did it. Oh. And Lisa says, oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Right. Joanne goes on to say, look, I can tell you the lady's lying on her back in her living room with her hands covered with an afghan and her hands, excuse me, with her face covered with an afghan and her hands bound. She said, I can prove it. I can even tell you the color of the footstool that's lying by the body. It was green. And Lisa just keeps saying, oh, yeah, okay, sure. Ooh, you and Lobo killed her, Ugh. right? Well, Lisa goes on to say, you know, and I saw them all driving around in a green 1972 Oldsmobile with a brown top the night before. And when Cersei says, you saw who driving around? She was like, I saw Joanne. I saw Joanne Taylor. Thomas Winslow, Joseph White, and Beth Johnson all driving around in that car the night before. So, yeah, I mean, I bet she did do it now that I think about it. And then Cersei asks her, you know, why didn't you report this? And she was like, well, I was scared because Joanne Taylor told me if I said anything, she'd kill me. And, you know, she's that type of girl. She's into drugs. She has a bad reputation. And I just, you know, I was scared. I was scared for my life. Okay. So on February 13th, 1989, with this new information from Lisa, Searcy decides he's going to go down and interrogate Thomas Winslow, which is one of the names that she named. He goes down, he interrogates Thomas Winslow without reading him his Miranda rights, falsely assuring him that he's not a suspect in Helen's homicide. And Winslow is sitting in the Lancaster County Jail being held on felony charges with a crime that he had committed a few months earlier. So it was easy to find Winslow. Oh, so when Searcy went to interview him, he was already... He was in already in jail. Okay. 
And so Thomas Winslow, he had been running around with Cliff Sheldon, and they committed a crime that essentially paralyzed a hotel clerk. They were going in to rob him, and it just kind of went wrong. Cliff beat the guy into pretty much he paralyzed the guy from beating him and so they both were in jail okay again i'm gonna go ahead and just say you guys please watch this documentary like it's so 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 good now this is not the first time that thomas winslow had been questioned like on police radar for this right like this is and this is also not the first time he had been questioned because when Searcy was working as a private investigator all on his own, he had his own little list and they included all these people that Lisa told him about and he had questioned them. So years before when he had questioned Tom, Tom was like, it couldn't have been me. I was working that night. Well, come to find out he was supposed to be working that night, but he never showed up for work. Like all of these things are not adding up. Now Thomas Winslow is detained. Searcy comes in to interrogate him as a sheriff deputy, right? And Winslow says, hey, I just wanted to go ahead and tell you, I, I didn't tell you the truth first time. I, I lied about being at work. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I just want to, I just want to come clean. And he was like, no, I know. I did my research and, and I know you lied to me. So he goes on to tell him that Lisa placed him at the scene along with Joseph White, who they call Lobo, okay, and Joanne Taylor. And of course, Tom is like, no, I, w I wasn't there. He said, oh, well, I, I let Lobo borrow my car that night. So that's probably why you saw him, because he borrowed, he borrowed my car. Okay. And he said, well, I borrowed, I let him, I let Lobo and Clifford Sheldon borrow my car, actually. Yeah, it was, it was Cliff and Lobo. And I didn't see him again for the next day. This is getting messy. There's names going around everywhere. I'm so glad you said that, Bailey. I wrote you a chart. Wow. We're going to go ahead and I'm going to walk you through this chart really quick and so hopefully the listeners can get this visual joseph white and joanne taylor were known to be friends okay and joanne was the one standing at the crime scene saying she did it to lisa right and joseph white he goes by lobo and joseph white goes by lobo okay joseph white and joanne knew thomas winslow and Thomas Winslow was married to Beth Johnson at the time. Okay. So they were, that's kind of a foursome, right? So you have Joseph White, who goes by Lobo, Joanne Taylor, and then Thomas White and his then wife. And those were the four people that Lisa said were in the vehicle. Joseph right. White, Joanne, Thomas, Thomas Winslow, or Lobo. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Thomas Winslow and Beth Johnson. Yep. Now... Thomas, remember, he committed that crime with Cliff. Right. And Cliff was married to Deborah. Cliff and Deborah Sheldon are married. Joanne Taylor also had a friend by the name of Charlotte Bishop, who we're going to talk about. Somehow, lots of people know this guy named James Dean. And finally, Joseph knew this chick named Kathy Gonzalez. So this is your chart. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Thomas Winslow says he wasn't there. Right? He let it he let Lobo have his car. Lobo and Cliff had his car. He didn't see him till the next day. He wasn't there. Guess what? Winslow's blood type, he's A positive. So it doesn't he's not B. Yeah. It's okay. not him. So February twenty fifth, nineteen eighty nine, Circe interviews Charlotte Bishop in the presence of her attorney. Her name had come up during multiple interviews, so he decides he's going to go interview Charlotte. Charlotte Bishop had previously been interviewed by the Beatrice Police Department with Detective Fitzgerald. And Detective Fitzgerald not only ruled her out, but he also said that she showed very limited intelligence and that she really couldn't be 
a viable source of information. Mm -hmm. She was very unkept. Her mental status was, she was lower functioning and he just didn't feel like she was a very good source of information. But Circe, of course, was like, hey, I, I need to talk to her. So during that interview, Bishop, Charlotte Bishop stated that Joanne Taylor had been living with her at the time of Helen's homicide. And according to Charlotte Bishop, on the day of Helen's murder, Joanne Taylor comes home. She's all nervous. She's upset. And she admitted, quote, I might have been involved in a murder. So now we have two people. We have Lisa and Charlotte, who have both heard Joanne say, I was involved in a murder. Okay. Joanne splits. She gets out of Dodge. They haven't seen her since. And what year did the murder happen? The murder happened in 1985. It's now 1989. Yes, yeah, so this years. is four years later. Again, why didn't you say anything the first time we talked about it? I'm scared of Joanne Taylor. She said she would have killed me. But when did she split town? Right after the murder, 1985. She had been gone for four years. So you're afraid that you're going to be killed by this person who left town? Who, who left town. Yes. And Circe is like, that's all I need. They keep saying Joanne Taylor. They also keep saying this dude Lobo. At this point, this is all I need. And so Circe's tenacity would be rewarded on March 16, 1989, when the Beatrice Daily Sun paper headline would read, Two Arrested in Four-Year-Old Beatrice Murder. On March 15th, so the day before the headlines, they both took a team. One team went down to Alabama after Joseph White, a.k.a. Lobo. Okay. So on the night of March 15th, Searcy, Deputy Dr. Wayne Price, and then Officer Sam Stevens interrogated Lobo. Despite their efforts... Lobo constantly, consistently, the whole time denied knowing anything about it. I wasn't there. I don't even know who this chick is. I don't know what to tell you. I wasn't there. Talking about Helen? Yeah, uh, I wasn't. Yeah, I don't know who Helen Wilson is. During the interrogation, Lobo requested up to three times for an attorney. I don't want to talk to you. I want an attorney. I don't want to talk to you. I want an attorney. And even though he kept saying that, Searcy kept on interrogating him. They told him that they have eyewitnesses that put him there and that they needed to get his DNA and that he was going to be placed under the arrest for the murder of Helen Wilson. They get his DNA. They bring him back to Nebraska. What is his blood type? Not B. It's O. Okay. But he's arrested. He's being held back in Beatrice. Even though his blood type doesn't match. Even though his blood type does not match. On that same night, on March 15th, that other team went up to North Carolina, where Joanne Taylor was currently living. They let the local police department know, and they start interrogation on Joanne Taylor. You're suspected in the murder of Helen Wilson. You need to come in, yada, yada. So Taylor gives this story that is wildly inconsistent with the details of Helen's murder. So according to her story, she and Lobo and this other boy that she didn't know, they were all in this dude's baby blue car. And they were driving up to Helen Wilson's house to do yard work for her. While they were doing yard work, Joanne Taylor asked Mrs. Helen Wilson to use her restroom. Helen showed her into her house and let her use the, the, the bathroom there. When she came out and when Helen turned around, Tom Winslow and Joseph White, they were standing in the doorway of her house with a knife drawn. And who's saying that this is what happened? Joanne. Joanne, Joanne Taylor. Taylor. 
is saying that this is what happened. Yeah. The she night- was like, yeah, I was, yeah, I was there. We went to her house in a light blue car to do yard work. And I needed to go to the bathroom and I went inside. And when we all turned around, Lobo and Tom were there holding a knife. But Lisa told Cersei that it that it was like a brown and green car, not a light blue one. Right? Well, maybe. Let's find out. So Helen Wilson, according to Joanne, demanded that those two boys get out of her house. Joanne tried to break past him because she was scared. Well, then Lobo turned the knife on her and told her he was going to kill her daughter. And then Lobo and Wilson attacked Helen, raped her, and stabbed her to death. And it happened about 5.30 that evening. So what does Circe do? They record, you know, they, they take her statement. On March 16th, Searcy and his um, officer, Stevens, were able to get up to North Carolina, and they start their own interrogation investigation, and they ask her again for her story. She gives them the same story. Searcy then says, I think you need a little bit of a break. They turn off the video, the tape recorder, to give her about a 45-minute break. When they turn it back on, Taylor thanked them for helping refresh her memory and then repeatedly attributes her faulty memory to a personality disorder. She said, I'm so sorry. Sometimes my memory gets fogged. I have a personality disorder. Guess who diagnosed her with a personality disorder a handful of years prior to this? The sheriff psychologist. The sheriff psychologist, Dr. Deputy Sheriff Wayne Price. How did he diagnose her if she was out of the state? Well, when she was still living in Beatrice, she did have a daughter. And there was suspect of abuse. And they referred her to Dr. Price to have treatment done. And he had talked her into giving up her rights to her daughter and had also explained to her that she has borderline personality disorder. And she was so happy to see Dr. Price there, right? She was so happy that he was there to be with her to help her through this whole case. And jog her memory with the camera off. Yep, to jog her memory. Searcy then began, quote, refreshing Joanne Taylor's memory by feeding her information through leads and suggestive questions. With his guidance, Joanne Taylor eventually recalled that Helen Wilson had been anally raped, that Helen lived in an apartment rather than a house, and that the other boy's car was in fact Thomas Winslow, and it was actually green and brown and Mm. not light blue. Okay. And every time she needed a break, They would turn the recording off, and every time they turned the recording back on, she would be able to recall more correct information. I bet um, Dr. Alceste would love this as far as, like, false confessions are concerned also. Oh, yeah. With this information, they fly her back to Nebraska, and she's booked. After being booked in jail... Joanne Taylor provides another statement to Searcy. So Searcy and then Officer Stevens had shown Joanne Taylor a packet of six photos to help her identify the male subject she had previously mentioned, right? So she's like, I I think it was Tom Winslow. I don't really know. If I saw a picture of him, I would be able to tell you, right? I'd be able to pick him up out out of a lineup. And sure enough, Joanne Taylor was able to identify Thomas Winslow as the subject of that, you know, that guy who she couldn't remember. She was like, yeah, that's him. That's the guy that I remember. Right. And again, thanks them for helping her jog her memory. I seriously cannot with this stuff right now. And then Joanne Taylor also recalled that one of the men had a bloody nose And that they probably, I think they were there to rob 
Helen, but not murder her. Like, murdering her was accidental. They were actually there to rob her. This is the most West Memphis 3 stuff. Like, if you if you listen to those confessions with those boys and how they're, mm -hmm. you know, in the interrogation and how they're fed information and questioned and this is mm -hmm. wild. Mm -hmm. So that was in the morning. She takes a break. Later that day, at Joanne Taylor's request, they contact Dr. Price and ask him to, quote, visit with Miss Taylor due to her emotional distress. And according to Dr. Price's consultation notes, Joanne Taylor mentioned that she was frightened during her flight to Beatrice from North Carolina and expressed significant fear for her safety, particularly from Thomas Winslow. The same Thomas Winslow, who in North Carolina, she didn't even know who he was and wasn't able to recognize him until she saw a picture of him. Right, right. But yet on the plane ride, she was scared of Thomas Winslow. Furthermore, Price observed that Taylor's borderline personality disorder appeared to be better managed than any previous clinical interactions with her. He noted there were no signs of delusions, hallucinations, phobias, or issues with short or long-term memory. Finally, Dr. Price stated that there was, quote, no indication that Joanne Taylor was legally incompetent or legally insane. She was just perfect, Bailey. Y'all, I really cannot with this dude. What was Joanne Taylor's blood type? Oh. So they're really trying to fit a square peg into a round hole here. So like I said, we're going to go over the facts of this case. So let's go over the facts of this case. Helen Wilson was murdered and raped in her first floor apartment in Beatrice, Nebraska. The cause of death was suffocation. Two blood types were found at the scene, O belonging to Helen, type B non-secretor belonging to one unidentified male. Helen's sister and brother-in-law found Helen's body and made that 911 call at 9.29 in the morning of February 6th, 1985, right? Mm-hmm. Not at 7.30 in the morning, like Lisa said. Not at 5.30 in the evening, like Joanne first said. 9.30 in the morning. When did um, Helen's son and daughter-in-law leave? Mm, it was around like 10.30 that night. Maybe 9.30. Maybe 9.30 that night because they were going to call her at midnight to remind her to take her second dose of cough medicine. Okay. At this point, we have two people in custody for the murder of Helen Wilson, Joanne Taylor, Joseph White, plus an accomplice, Thomas Winslow, who's already detained for an unrelated felon. The next step is going to be figuring out who has that type B blood, because they don't have it, but by golly, someone does. Well, and not to mention the other fact of the case is that the FBI profiler said that it was one person acting alone, Correct. but the sheriff's office and, and, and or the local police department are now convinced that there were at least two people working together to do this. And you were exactly right. The sheriff's department has decided to launch their formal investigation. Which is retired homeboy, Cersei, and Dr... Dr deputy dude a homeboy who's diagnosing her with borderline and then talking about like delusions and hallucinations which doesn't even really tie into borderline personality disorder i mean it can but that's not one of the diagnostic criteria or features for that mm -hmm. so what do i know so now we're literally only like two days later this is all happening in the span it started March 15th, 1989. Now we're at March 17th, 1989. Wow, them boys work fast in two days, huh? 
and Bailey. I think this is a great stopping point for part one. Oh my gosh, you're doing a two-parter? I'm doing a two-parter. Can you believe it? No, I can't believe it. There must be a whole bunch of shit left. If yeah. This is only half of it. There really is. What do you think so far? This is crazy. I'm sure all of my the buttons are going to be pushed towards the second half, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, do you feel like your buttons are already starting to get pushed with all this stuff? Not really. I mean, it's not more so than normal of just like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I just mean like with the ethics of, of the therapist. Yeah, it's not my favorite. I, I really think this is the best place to stop is we have two people in jail. Joanne Taylor, Joseph White, arrested for the murder of Helen Wilson and an accomplice, Thomas Winslow, and they're all in jail, or they're all being detained, right. I should say, and none of them have type B blood. Right. Oh, boy. This is, oh. this is messy. I'm just, I'm, I'm interested to see how this ties into, like, the interview with Dr. Loftus, because I imagine that we're going to start getting to, like, there's some crazy recovered memories and it was probably sheriff, doctor, deputy, homeboy doing hypnosis and they had all these recovered memories of the crime and it's just going to be fucking crazy. That's right. Or maybe not. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it will I be. have to say I'm so <laughs> proud of myself because you were like, Oh, really? Oh, you really went in, sister, and didn't see your dead sister laying in that little tiny apartment? Oh, <laughs> really? You left? Oh, wait. Oh, really? You saw this person? Oh, really? The three-person name? Oh, wait. Like, that's a lot. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in this. It, there's a lot going on with this, and I didn't realize that it's called the, what is it? Be a, Beatrice. Beatrice 6. Mm -hmm. Oh man! Oh boy! Yeah, we're at we're at three. How many more can we get? Oh, all right. Well, I want to see what happens. I want to see what what the future holds with the six. Tune in. Tune in later. We'll give you part two. All right. Well, we'll see you guys in just a little bit. Same bat place. Same bat channel. Bye, Bye guys. guys. Wildside Tribe, don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Wildside Podcast. Make sure to tune in on Wildside Wednesdays. New episodes will drop each Wednesday at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We would love to hear from you, so if you have a wild case recommendation, email us at wildsidepodcast at gmail.com. That's wildside with a C. Or share your thoughts in the comments below. As always, if you haven't heard it today, you're loved, you're worthy, and you're valuable. And we'll catch you on the, the flip, flip side.